Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 329, featuring part 3 of my interview with Mr. Rob Irving. This part of the interview, we talk a lot about a lot of fun stuff. We talk about the 3DO, little game uh, called Wing Commander 3. Uh, we also talk about the Jane's combat simulations that he worked on, including uh, Longbow, as well as a little bit more about Strike Commander. Uh, we also ch uh, chat about a full motion video and uh, Star Citizen and much, much more. A lot of great stuff here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Rob Irving. You ever read that book, The History? Well, I can't remember the title. Huge title, like The History of the Making of the Atomic Bomb or something like that. You know, that huge, <laughs> huge book. I have not read that huge book, but it sounds like a good read. Oh, it's, it's, you'd probably really love it. It's full of math. I mean, <laughs> Yay, all math! of this math and equations and things. An English major that loves math. Yeah, it's perfectly normal. <laughs> well, so then we get this Jane's combat simulations with the, with a the helicopter with the, the oh. AH-64D longbow. Now, I didn't know much about Jane, so I had to I looked that up and was kind of intrigued by by that. You know, that yeah, whole that, company. They is a civilian. What do they call it? The closest thing to a civilian intelligence agency. That they are they are the experts in all things military. I mean, they know. They know things that we weren't allowed to know, basically, you know. Um, we... Are you on, like, a bunch of watch lists now? That's a... <laughs> Probably not. I hope not. Um, but, yeah, I mean, even on Strike Commander, we did a lot of research, and there were limits to what we could find out. You know, it's like, we want to know how fast an AMRAM is, a missile is, and um, no. <laughs> that, the answer to that was no. But we actually had a military consultant on Longbow. Um, the Jane's line was, was very heavy-duty semi. Um, Strike Commander was a little lighter, you know. But that that game, I learned a lot working on Longbow. That's still one of the games I'm proudest of because it was such a good sim, and it's still it's one of the games I still played after it shipped. Which a lot of games that you work on, you just like I have seen enough of this. Go that away. Chapter <laughs> is over. Yeah, it's like the box is in the, in the hands of the consumers now. I don't need it. <laughs> well, that one was Computer Gaming World and gave that the one of the best games of all time, number one hundred on there. It was a it was a pretty amazing game, and I mean, all kinds of awards and stuff, right? There. Yeah, that's the the guys. You know, they put so much work into the detail on it, into you know getting everything to work the way it was supposed to work, and getting the helicopter to do all the things. I mean, we had a helicopter pilot who worked walked us through a lot of this stuff and helped us understand. I mean, some of the guys got to actually go sit in a long bow i didn't oh <laughs> uh, uh, were you like on the office that day or what uh, i got there to that project a little late and my, my role at origin was often kind of like the closer role i mean you know i come in in the ninth inning after my project ships somebody else needs me right now on their game that they're panicking about so you know I, there was actually a time i was literally running down the hall with my desk upside down with my computer on it pushing it to a new office to get on the next game and so I ended up getting on, on the middle or the end of a lot of games. So I, I missed the Longbow visit because it was before I got there. But yeah, that, that game, the, they did a great job in the realism and the functionality of the helicopter. And that's, I mean, that's the star of the show, right? Is it it's, more fun making a helicopter game than a, a fixed-wing aircraft game? <sighs> no, I don't think I could say that. It's just, it's very different. It's, uh, it's, I mean, it's probably more akin to Descent than a plane game is because of the way you fly it. Um, and, you know, you could actually auto-rotate and all that stuff so you could get your, your helicopter doing its thing, bouncing up and down. But, um, yeah, that, that actually probably is the one that's closest to what I'm working on right now just because of the way the helicopter flew. But it was just so neat that, you know, you could just peek up over a hill with your little radar dome and push a button and then the tank three miles away goes... Pew! <laughs> They're like, that's how we operate. That's exactly what we do in the field. They never see us. <laughs> did you ever get to meet Bruce Artwick? No, I did not. I just thought I'd ask that, and I'll flight simulator that. <laughs> well, this is something I, I've often thought about with these flight simulators, because it seems like there's different, there's some that are very realistic with the physics, and others that are more sort of arcade. Yeah. I mean, just sort of, where do you... Uh, how do I phrase it? You know, so how do you make it fun... But, like, how do you decide that balance, I guess, of uh, fun but not too realistic? I think that's wants complexity really... to keep it interesting but not, you know, to baffle the... 
I think really the answer to that is is really what audience are you aiming for? Because I mean, if you think about it, there is a huge market for Microsoft Flight Simulator, mm -hmm. and all that is is just doing a plane. You know, just flying a plane. It's just everything is just exactly accurate, basically. You know, you have to do your pre-flight checklist. You have to warm up everything, and you know, flip all the switches and push all the buttons. And it takes you like three minutes to get into the air. I'm like, what? I just want to get out there and shoot something. <laughs> and of course, you can't do that in Microsoft Flight Simulator, so that kind of you know takes away that part of it. So I don't understand that market necessarily. That's not really my niche. But if that's the the audience you're going for, you know, they want that. So, for instance, on the Jane stuff, we had a certain market, and that was hardcore sim people. So that's we went full bore that route. I mean, everything needed to be as realistic as possible. And that was the primary role of the game, you know, was to make it feel like that aircraft. Um, Strike Commander tried to, to, you know, get close to that line, but not, not as far over. It, we did try to have fairly realistic performance and everything on the plane. But at the end of the day, it was more of an arcade game. Um, I mean, if you think about it, Chris's, Chris's games oftentimes have had that same threat of, we're, we're all about a big story, cool flight, and you know, going out and shooting people down. The, that you know, wing commander, strike commander, whichever it, the commanders, you know. So, I, I think the answer is really all of those are appropriate depending on what what game you're trying to make. But I, I think I lean more on the side of let's let's be a little little loosey goosey with the the realism, and because that, that, that's yeah, that's where I like to play. I just think about descent. Where would you put that on the on our little spectrum that we're making here? Um, descent is, I believe, the the best answer to that is physics. Who needs them? <laughs> so, <laughs> I there want is, that class anyway. Yeah, there's nothing realistic about descent. I mean, if you watch the ships fly, it's like that's just ludicrous. A, a person could not survive that, which is why we were, we're drones for ours instead of piloted ships, because a person really could not survive that. What our ships do? I mean, they're bobbing around like just crazy pinballs. So you know, You're crushing dreams right now. You know, <laughs> Jordan on, and we were talking about the battle techs, you know, the mechs, mech warrior games, and he's like, "Well, oh. really, that would never work because it would just sink it to the ground." <laughs> like, no, I don't want to know that. Craters. Exactly, that's all. It would be two big craters in a, in, a, in a mech that's just standing there. You now have a turret. <laughs> it's like there's a point when you just go, "Eh, whatever," <laughs> and you go on about your life. It's like I, I don't. I don't worry about that, and, and certainly that's Eric's one of Eric's main mantras. Is it's like if it's fun, we'll do it. It doesn't matter if it's realistic in this game, and you certainly could not get away with that on, on a longbow. <laughs> you, you just oh, well, I think our, our helicopter needs to fly like ten times as fast. No, no, it doesn't. <laughs> we want to turn this thing into Airwolf. Hmm? I remember Airwolf, the old show. <laughs> See, fun, not real. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about the Wing Commander uh, series. Wait. So you done the the third one, right? I think you said the third one was the one you had the strongest, uh, or was it the fourth one where you had the strongest? Three was the one I worked on. That was really like the one I was on full time for. Well, once I got onto it again, I, I was on at the beginning of it, but once I got onto it, yes, that one that one was my real official job. Wing Four I helped out with, um, and Wing Three Three D O I also that one I actually did start to finish, mm -hmm. but um, I mean it was just a port. Yeah, Wing Three was the Wing Three was the the most involved, other than Prophecy, which actually that one I was part of the inception of. So, um, but Wing Three was the big epic movie style, and that one. Oh yeah, I mean Chris. If if nothing else, Chris can be looked back on historically as changing the game industry completely with the games he's made. I mean, Wing Commander was just ludicrous to think about it now how much we had to put into the movie making aspect of that but you know it the end result was well i mean it kind of speaks for itself it was a cool game i mean and i i didn't care about the movie stuff that much i hit escape a lot I, <laughs> you hit escape a lot oh i've already heard all this dialogue <laughs> like 18 times over <laughs> but yeah i mean it's it's an amazing project, and I my favorite part is just the flying around shooting things, of course. But um, 
And again, that's one where you th- if you think about it too much, it's like this isn't realistic. It doesn't have to be realistic. I mean, one of the things that Chris always liked is he wanted his it to feel like World War II. That's it was carriers in space, if you think about it that way. Mm-hmm. And so even like the, the, the ships when they take off doing the little dip as they leave the, the carrier, totally out of World War II movies. Not realistic even a little bit. But it looked cool, so that's what Chris wanted to do. Like it took a they must have been inspired by Wrath of Khan, right? And all that stuff they put oh, on the Enterprise that too. And like the subs. <laughs> that that too. That's very much so. Yeah. Subs and, and aircraft carriers. That's that's where those games came from for the most part. And the end result was something that just was completely astonishingly new, if you think about it. That we were making a movie with a game inside it. Or is it a game with a movie inside it? Which one or the other. But you're playing the main character in the movie. That's pretty cool. Because a lot of games have tried to do that, just pure storytelling, just the movie part. And it doesn't really translate as well. But when you add the, the gameplay element, the arcade gameplay element to it, there you go. And now it, now it works. So yeah, that was that was a fun game to work on. It was it was pretty pretty huge, but it was a fun game to work on. I know that's we're kind of getting close to opening up that can of worms, right? With the <laughs> cutscene, can of worms, cutscenes, are... <laughs> and gameplay, and where to. That is a huge can of they worms. They immersion. Do they take you away from the game and all that? Oh, and and you know that's. That still, that's that's Chris's trademark, and you know, even on Star Citizen, he's he's taking that to the new level, where you know, you look at a character, and your eye contact actually affects the conversation, all that stuff that he wants to do with this one, is that to the next level, and whether you you just prefer that or not is up to you, but uh, it's still cool. <laughs> I, what I, is I it? Still, your eye contact? What 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 is this? You you, you look if at? you. Like uh, what he wants to do with the conversation system, and, and I don't, you know, how, know how far along this part of it is, but it's going to be part of Squadron Forty Two. So when you break eye contact with somebody, a char- with another character, when you walk away from a conversation, they react to that. They say, "Hey, what are you doing? Where are you going?" Um, but you look at them to start a conversation. They know when you're looking at them. So I don't know if that's cool or creepy, you know? isn't like... that isn't that just absolute lunacy? It's it's super cool and creepy at the same time. <laughs> But yeah, it's it's just that's that's where Chris is. He is he is right between Hollywood and, and game industry, and so that's you know that's where he that's where he fits. So yes, I still might hit escape a lot when I play Squadron Forty Two, but <laughs> that's okay. Maybe you don't even have to hit escape; you can just look away, right? And then that's true. I, I could probably just be rude to everyone on my ship. They'll, they'll hate me. But that's okay. <laughs> so you did the you said you did the three D O version of this. And... Wing 3 3 d Oh, so tragic. Tragic. Um, well, I mean, because we took all those beautiful spaceships, and, and to make it run on the 3 d they had to be, like, you know, they're looking for 30 polygons on these ships now to run on the 3 d I had one down to eight. That was one of my jobs on that <laughs> game, one of the few games I actually Getting shipped. Getting down to, like, Elite. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, you, you've got a ship that's got a two, a two tail pieces and a wing, three polygons. That's it. Each one's got a poly on it. And I mean, th- these things were so beautiful. And then, then I'd take them in there and break them down and make them into little, little, like paper mache versions of themselves, like the build your own airplane kits that you get with the balsa wood. That, that's oh, sort of those. how those. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, the game itself worked out great for the 3DO, and we even we even made some small changes to the storyline and everything to make it more compact. Because I mean, it's still shipped on what three CDs. Um, for the 3DO, but the fact that we could get the game to run on the 3DO at all was pretty pretty cool. I think I heard um, you say you really like the 3DO as, as a system, right? You just I think the 3DO had the some of my favorite games. Not, they had, had a lot of really crappy games, but it had enough really good games on it. The problem was at $700, there was no way it was going to ever succeed. You know, who's going to spend $700 on a game console? Apparently, the answer to that was pretty much nobody. Trip Hawkins. <laughs> <laughs> right, trip trip could afford one, and we all got one when we worked for 3DO. So that's uh, that, well, that was later on. But yeah, when I was working on uh, Heroes of Might and Magic or Warriors of Might and Magic, Warriors of Might and Magic, we we all got 3DO systems because we were working for 3DO. So that's the only reason I had one because I couldn't afford one either. <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, I ended up buying every game I could get my hands on, and some of them were just horrible. And and like what, okay, I, what's the most horrible? 3DO Night game. Trap. 
Night Trap, the one with the uh, what's her name from Dana Plato from Different Strokes, all live movie clips, and oh, oh my God, that game. I, I just I don't even understand where that game came from, but. <laughs> Can you say so? Come on, Sarah, what's the first thing you think of? Party! Music! Hillary Clinton still remembers it. Wasn't that the one that she got all uh, her and uh, Lieberman got all upset about back in the day? I don't know. I don't know if anyone really. I, probably they did because you know, girls at a slumber party or something. I guess was the story with, with like a killer or something. I don't even remember the plot anymore. Did it have a plot? <laughs> it was supposed to. That may be why I don't remember it because maybe it, I never found it. But it just everything was just so herky jerky and the movie clips didn't work very well and it was just it, it had to be so canned because they could only have so much footage so everything just felt awkward all the time and that mist which ran like a slideshow on there it would be like you'd turn and then it would take 15 20 seconds to load up the next picture then you turn again so by the time you walked across like a room it, it had taken you like five minutes just to load up all the different angles you had to look at. It so. made the world feel so immense, though, right? <laughs> yeah, oh, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it could have been five rooms, and it, it would have taken you days to play it. But, yeah, that's, that, that was one of the downsides of the 3DO, is that their, their disc read time was pretty bad. So games like that suffered for it. I wonder which, why they had that, that flaw. Was that just un, unavoidable, or would it? I guess they're like it's already seven hundred bucks, you know. I can't. Yeah, exactly. We can't. We can't shave any more off of this. Sorry, guys. That's seven hundred bucks is where we're stopping. So you know, that's you're not going to get a good CD drive out of it. But it, and, and plus, I mean, those were really early generations. So you know, what's interesting is you're you're kind of like right on that right in that era of where full motion video is just like it's still really cool and people just want to see video on their on their device so bad, right? <laughs> yeah, well... I guess the games like from that era tainted it forever. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what Command & Conquer is about the only series that still uses it, right? That That's true. There are not as many. That's That we, we that era has kind of passed. But here comes Chris again, so, you know, here, here come the <laughs> movies again. And maybe that means that'll come back. Maybe it'll just be, you know, a niche thing. But I think that... Uh, yeah, that, I, I lived during the heyday of that. We, we, we brought it, and then we killed it. <laughs> and that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with the uh, fourth and final installment of my interview with Mr. Irving. I'm going to miss him. He's a really fun guy to chat with as i'm sure you can see from these interviews as always i want to thank you very 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 much because you are the ones who are keeping these episodes coming no way it would happen without you so if you are supporting the show thank you very very much if you would like to join that august uh, august body is it august or august anyway those awesome dudes and dudettes uh, that are supporting the show just go to the link in the show notes to the patreon site and become a Matreon, if you will. <laughs> yeah, I just thought of that. Ah, uh, let's see. What about that news from the Mat Cave? <laughs> Cut!
got some really awesome news today, man. I, I discovered this thing called Google. <laughs> if you, if you type in retro game news, man, it's uh, I'm blown away by the stuff that popped up. I mean, it's, it's really cool. Uh, okay, so first off, there's something coming out called the Coleco Chameleon. Uh, this is a uh, sort of a vintage-esque platform for new games, uh, but the new games have to have 8-bit or 16-bit aesthetics. So think about something like Shovel Knight, for example. Uh, they are, apparently did release this thing at a toy fair or announced it, got a bunch of uh, hubbub going around it, but then uh, the, the Kickstarter that was supposed to help fund it has been delayed, supposedly so they can make it even more awesome, uh, whatever that means. Anyway, you can look at it on the Facebook page. Uh, you can find some pictures of it from the Toy Fair. Uh, one cool thing about it is that it's going to use physical cartridges, uh, which is pretty neat. You know, in this era where everything is uh, online, all the Steam and GOG stuff, it's kind of cool to, uh, for a device to have these physical cartridges again. So I thought I would pass that on. looks pretty interesting. Uh, also, there's a ZX Spectrum, uh, what is this thing called? The Vega Mobile. This is a handheld device. I did say ZX Spectrum. You thought I was going to say ZX Spectrum, didn't you? Uh, anyway, this thing's got an LCD screen, micro SD cards. It has a thousand games built into the, to the thing. Uh, it went on Indiegogo. I think they were trying to raise something like 100,000 pounds or euros or whatever that weird looking thing is. Uh, but they already hit 281% of that goal. Uh, so that's, uh, it looks really cool. I I'm really like to pick one of these up just because I'm not really, as an American, didn't really see a lot of ZX stuff back in the day. So this might be a fun way uh, to learn about that. And it, I like that it uses uh, the micro SD cards as well. And then a final bit of news, a bit of buyer's beware warning. Um, apparently GameStop, is selling, uh, inadvertently selling, fake retro games. Uh, so if you're a retro games collector and you're going to uh, check out these game stops looking for these rare cartridges, uh, just be wary. I'll post a link to this article so you can read more about this. But apparently some unscrupulous criminals really are swapping out labels and pulling other shenanigans to try to uh, rip off GameStop and by extension uh, innocent people that just want to collect <laughs> some damn games. So anyway, read about that. Uh, hopefully GameStop will do something uh, to stop that. But uh, in the meantime, just practice some common sense and, and be careful. Uh, know what you're buying before you uh, pony up a hundred bucks or more for something. All right, I think that'll do it for the news. Uh, oh, uh, one, one last little bit of news. Uh, I still have some of those gameplay DVDs available. Uh, so <laughs> If you want one of those, I'm trying to sell them for 15 bucks, but I'll take uh, down to 10 for those. Uh, so just go to the link in the show notes to the eBay site. If you can't afford the 15, uh, go ahead and, and uh, submit a, a bid for 10 bucks. And if I have some left, I'll go ahead and send it to you. But anyway, I really want to get those uh, things out. So if you're kind of waiting around for whatever reason, uh, please uh, just go ahead and buy one of those things. All right, what about that ale of the week? Uh, I thought I was done with these, uh, with the sodas, but, uh, you know, I don't know where she's finding them, but uh, <laughs> uh, my wife is really coming through with some really exotic stuff. This is uh, one called Swamp Pop. Uh, this is a premium sugar cane soda, noble cane cola. You know, and it looks so, so interesting. I thought, what the hell? Okay, so carbon, let's see, anything? It's got something in it called Quilaja. Quilaja extract. <laughs> Quilaja? Quilaja? Never heard of that one before. Uh, let's see. Made with pure Louisiana cane sugar. Woohoo! You know, I am actually from Louisiana, so I'll... Not sure if I can tell the difference between a pure Louisiana cane sugar and a New York cane sugar, but I guess we'll find out. Uh, let's see. Contains no fruit juice. Whew! I was getting kind of worried there for a minute. It might have some kind of healthy component. Uh, anyway, let's get this thing open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this Swamp Pop Noble Cane Cola here in the rather... Well, I do declare that will get your attention in a hurry. Woo, ah. I don't know what the hell I'm smelling here, but I'm definitely smelling something. I guess it must be that Qualuja extract. 
Uh, definitely a very pronounced aroma coming off of this. It's not bad. It's uh, kind of like a Pepsi on steroids, I guess. You know that sort of, if you smell a Pepsi and you smell a Coke, you know, they smell a little bit different. Uh, whatever that difference is, if you ratcheted, uh, ratcheted that up a bit, uh, that's kind of what this smells like. It actually smells uh, pretty good. I'm kind of warming up to the uh, to the <laughs> smell on this. It has a bit of a wang to it, as we might might say down south. Anyway, let's uh, give this uh, Swamp Pop a taste. <clears throat> well, I think this might put some webbing in between those fingers and toes. <sighs> I don't know how to describe this. Let me, let me try it again. It's not bad. It's kind of like a, uh, it's sort of like a Pepsi, but there's definitely some uh, other flavors in there. Can't quite uh, <laughs> describe it. It's very sweet. Uh, kind of a, a, kind of thicker and creamier than a than a Coca-Cola or Pepsi would be. Uh, kind of a little bit syrupy, maybe. Thankfully, it's not very swampy or whatever that what, whatever that would mean. Uh, actually, I gotta say. Let me try it one more time here. You know, I, I could see uh, getting used to this and uh, really enjoying this. It's uh, definitely uh, interesting flavors. It's definitely different than the standard sort of sodas you might try. Uh, I don't really know how to describe that, the flavor here. Like I say, it's not quite like anything I've tasted. A little bit sort of a vaguely sort of orangey type taste. Um, what is that? It's got some sort of after flavors as well. Anyway, it's quite good. I think if you're looking for something really interesting uh, that doesn't taste like an ordinary soda, it could do a lot worse than this Noble Cane Cola. Definitely very, uh, very sugary. Uh, I'm going to go... Uh, uh, I, got, I think I'll go with a 4 out of 5 drinking horns on this. Uh, I enjoy it. I think it would take some getting used to, as uh, you know, I'll say that, but... Overall, it's, it's quite nice. Uh, so four out of five for the Swamp Pop. All right, so let's wrap this up with a quotation. And uh, let me just read this quote to you, and then I'll tell you who said it afterward, because I think it's, it's kind of nice. It goes something like this. You know how there are some stars out there who know how to market themselves? I don't have that. Little observation there by Mark Hamill. See you guys next week.